uh, 30 points. You know, the two IT names which reported, LTT has reported earlier, uh, sorry, KPIT reported uh, numbers uh, during market hours yesterday. That is up on 3.5%. It's come off the high point of the day. LTTS is the other one, uh, which uh, came out with numbers, 8% on that one. We spoke with both companies. And then, of course, you had Coforge, which reported numbers. Uh, there was a margin miss, miss, but revenues were good. Stocks up about 1.5%. Uh, actually, uh, you know, let's... Uh, Go across to the conversation my colleague uh, Reema had with uh, Sudhir Singh, CEO and Executive Director at CoForge. She began by asking uh, him about the rationale behind the 13 to 16 percent growth guidance amidst persisting macro uncertainties. Listen in. So we expect the macros to continue to be depressed through FI24, and that's something that we've baked into our forecasts when we offered the 13 to 16 percent growth. And the one thing that's differentiated us so far in the results that I have seen in quarter four has been not just the fact that our numbers were where they were 5% sequential growth. To my mind and to our collective mind at CoForge, what was more important was that our growth was broad-based. We grew across client, client size cohorts. We grew across verticals, across geos, across service lines. So what gives us comfort is the fact that the ramp getting into fiscal year 24, in our case, given the 5% sequential US dollar-based growth, is obviously very steep. What we need to do is just around 3% growth sequentially over the next four quarters to hit a 15% number. We don't think that's in the realm of the impossible. We think it's very, very possible. And our intent will really be to A, make sure that we secure that, and then make every effort to try to exceed it in fiscal year 24. So what gives me confidence in summary is the broad-based nature of the growth, the fact that we aren't reliant or relying on one vertical or one geo, or one or two clients to drive that growth for us. And the second thing, of course, is even in a macro like this, if you look at our performance, in the quarter that went through, we called out the fact that we closed two large deals. We also equally importantly said that the quarter that has already started, quarter one, we are one month into it, we expect the deal velocity to continue. Our next 12 month signed order book is $869 million. That's more than 20% higher than where that same metric was 12 months back. So it's a mix of all of this, the RAM that we have, the order book that we've signed, the deal velocity that we've seen and continue to see. Uh, and the fact that all we need to do is clock about 3% sequential for four quarters. That gives us the comfort. You said your guidance bakes in macro uncertainty. Could you elaborate a bit more? Have any of your clients canceled any projects? Are they going slow on ramp ups or projects have been deferred? What has been the extent of growth loss due to the uh, depressed macros, as you called it? So it depends on which industry you touch. And in a macro like this, almost any enterprise client across the world has clearly elongated their decisioning cycles and is taking a microscope to just about any spend area. So that's a given. That's a reality. We aren't assuming or baking in something that hasn't been in play for the last three odd months. That's 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 uh, that's that's how we're seeing uh, that's how we're seeing the macros. If I were to parse that out into how we see it by industries, there's obviously a reasonable amount of diversion, a difference, right? Banking, the pressure is incredibly high, especially in sectors like mortgage. From our vantage, we are assuming that we will not touch the kind of growth that we saw in fiscal year 23 in banking at all. Fiscal year 23, we grew 47 percent. Our assumption is growth will slow down very considerably and growth will be roughly only around 15 odd percent in banking. When it comes to insurance, it's a, it's a different story. The space that we play in is largely commercial speciality SMB. Commercial speciality SMB continues to see resilient demand. It's the LNA side where we're seeing more of course consolidation. And insurance, the other factor that's uh, playing up well is our penetration into newer geos in the insurance vertical is working well and likely to continue to work well. So quarter four, illustratively, we talked about 10 new logos being added. Four of them came from insurance in Asia Pacific. So that's, that's a growth vector in insurance. And finally, travel is a completely different story altogether. The commitment, the confidence that travel clients, particularly airlines and airports have, right now is very, very significant. So we look at macros by verticals. The story is divergent. Banking, we see very significant headwinds. We are baking all of it, creating a composite picture. 
and hence calling out the 13 to 16 percent growth that I talked about. So basically, uh, since you said growth is going to be broad based on FI24, all your three key verticals, banks, insurance and uh, travel hospitality will all see a growth of about 15 percent, right? That's right. It's going to be broad based and it's going to be not as dispersed as it was in FI23. That's so right. this basically means that insurance which actually de-grew is going to grow quite handsomely. And it's only because the space that you operate in is seeing resilient yeah. demand. Well, uh, insurance, uh, it, it's not a forward looking view only that we're offering. Quarter four that just closed, insurance has been the fastest growing vertical. Insurance for us in quarter four has grown 5% sequentially already. So insurance has a really good ramp getting into FI24. And all we're talking about is a 15% growth. If you take out fiscal year 23 for the previous four years, insurance was the growth driver for CoForge. And we see insurance normalizing and coming back to its usual performance levels for us as a business unit. Can we talk a bit about uh, margins then? So the, the complaint is that despite a strong increase in your jump up in your offshoring, I think last year went up by nearly 500 basis points. The rupee has seen a 10% depreciation. There has been a pickup in utilization, yet the improvement in gross margins is not as much as what the street would have liked, even if we take into account your uh, hedge losses. Can you explain what happened on the gross margin? Are you getting more aggressive on the deal front? Is it just purely investments in employees? And where, why is the gross margin improvement limited to that point? So gross margins, actually, this year's the year that closed was a good story for us. Our gross margins during COVID had dropped significantly because of the pricing pressures that we saw on the travel business side. This has been a turnaround year for us. Our gross margins have gone up 55 bips in FY23 over FY22. More importantly, today when I gave the guidance, I very clearly called out FY24 over FY23 will again see another positive bip of an, a bib, uh, blip of 50 bips. Uh, a lot of the questions that we're getting is why is the gross margin increase not flowing into EBITDA? And, and we're pretty clear on that. When, when macros are uncertain, it is imperative that one presses the, the pedal on growth, tries to achieve minimum guidance offered and exceed it. That's the approach we are taking. Once the SGNA hits 15 odd percent, that's when we're going to take the feet off the pedal when it comes to investments and make sure that we let uh, some other GM increase fall down to the EBITDA as well. When do you think the SGNA percentage as a percentage of your revenues hit 15 percent, which is the target that you have in mind in terms of investments? I think that's going to be a tactical call. Uh, we have a reasonable amount of dispersion on gross margin on a quarterly basis. So we'll keep looking at how gross margin is trending. We'll keep looking at how the margins, uh, how the market is faring. Uh, we would like to make sure that we continue to invest. The percentage 50 odd bips is likely to move up or down. Difficult to call out the quarter, it's going to hit 15%. Okay, so then in another way, do you think FI25 onwards? Once the investments that you've made in the company are perhaps close to completion, will margins start improving? And what would be the long-term aspirational margins for CoForge? No, absolutely. FI25 onwards, EBITDA also should start moving up. In FI24, gross margin, I've already called out, will go up. Uh, our aspiration is that at the point when we hit $2 billion, our adjusted EBITDA should have gone up by a minimum of 150 bips and in a very positive scenario, all the way up to 300 bips. So CoForge at 2 billion compared to CoForge at a billion dollars today should have an adjusted EBITDA between 150 to 300 bips higher than where we are today. Uh, that's, uh, thank you very much for that uh, number. And just one final question. Your deal wins are down on a quarter on quarter basis. Uh, should we read anything into that? No, I think the only thing you should read into our deal wins is that we are still closing deals in, in the kind of macros that we have. Quarter three was an aberration. Quarter three this year saw five large deals, which is the highest in the 40-year history of the organization. So quarter three is not a great reference. What, what we, we feel very positive about is that quarter four, when there were the kind of headwinds, especially in the banking sector, we were able to sign a large deal in banking. Another one, of course, came from travel. And the other thing that we very explicitly, very consciously, very clearly called out in the investor call today is 
even in the current quarter, quarter one where one month is already over, we expect the deal velocity to continue to be robust. Okay, so that's the management of CoForge. The stock is up around a percent, percent and a half at this point in time. Just watch out for Nestle because that stock has gained over two odd percent on a week-to-date basis. And contrary to what we are seeing in a stock such as HUL, which is down around percent and a half post numbers, we are seeing Nestle hold up with a gain of around four tenths of a percent. It has already reported numbers. It was a good set of numbers. So there is another FMCG company which is in focus on account of that. Maybe data consumer should come up for you as well. That one reported numbers too. Let's see how that one too is doing. Time for a short break. On the other side, we'll put the focus on some of the IT stocks.